right there was the exact moment that that jump started the Fast and Furious franchise after it was thought to have stalled out completely. A moment so ridiculous, so unbelievably silly, but executed just right that it took this outrageous scenario and rewired what the eventual new era of this now 20 year long franchise would become. Say what you will about Fast films after 5, but there is a reason that Fast 5 is regarded as a fan favorite out of all of them. You see, that vault scene we just looked at a few seconds ago? That was real. That actually happened. Two cars dragging a 9,000 pound vault through the streets of Rio de Janeiro, smashing it through real constructed buildings, ramming it into real police cars, all initially done practically, giving audiences the perfect blend of suspending their disbelief while simultaneously providing enough visual evidence that this well, this was happening. It raised the tensions and the stakes in that moment of the film by showing you something like this, is, that, that it's somehow possible. Ups, that attachment that you, the audience, have in investing in these characters by putting them in seemingly real danger. Or, as Jack Eel, one of Fast Five stunt coordinators, perfectly summed up, if we keep it real, it makes them feel like something that they could be involved in. And I think that's what really makes the difference with, you know, any kind of action series is to put the audience in the seat with you and then they feel like they're a part of it. And that's what makes it exciting and entertaining. The film still having a connection with reality at that perfect line. This is a jump the building moment. Yes, I meant to say building, not shark. Compare that scene in the fifth film and then this scene in the seventh film, wherein a car is jumped between two of the most famous towers in Abu Dhabi, a feat that you know inherently is impossible to do, and you get a different emotion. There was a lot of fantastic stunt work putting that scene together to make it look like it happened. The only difference is that the full sequence that edited together didn't actually happen as shown in the film. So how did Fast Five construct a heist scenario so ludicrous that on paper sounds impossible, but was pulled off not just for effectiveness in the film, but in reaction as well, without making it mostly CGI like future Fast and Furious films would? Let's break it down. Fast Five spends its runtime building up a rather perfect flow of momentum and high octane action culminating in a bank vault heist that would require some of the most exact timing for a stunt crew ever. The roughly 10 minute long sequence starts with Dom and Brian ripping a whole 9,000 pound bank vault out of a police station with two twin chargers. Once free and outside of the police garage, the brakes aren't pumped on the planned action as the first turn out of the garage tosses the momentum of, again, a real 9,000 pound vault. Flying past cars behind them, rolling over several concrete barriers while a camera moves along a dolly low to the ground, almost being destroyed by the vault rolling right on top of it. The fact that this was the only only time they took a guess as to where the camera may not get hit since they would have no clue where the force of the rolling vault would crush it is pretty remarkable, but I digress. The main intermediary chunk of the sequence follows the cars drag the vault to the streets, right through bus stops, cars, buildings, you name it. Things that in real life would affect the movement of a vault or these vehicles. For each of these setups along the way, they went and built real structures with the intent of having them destroyed. That means that one little mess up could cost the production thousands, if not millions, to set it all up and rebuild it again. There was very little margin for error. Luckily, before the film even starts shooting, the stunt coordinators like Jack go from earlier, began planning and practicing the exact dimensions of where everything needs to be upwards of three to four months before filming. So, when it comes time to turn on the camera and perform these stunts on the actual set, they know to an incredible degree exactly what their margin of error is. Now, unforeseen mess-ups do happen from time to time. For example, here's this motorcycle stunt where the rider had special back tires to launch off of when the car he is supposed to crash into hits him, as to make sure he doesn't land incorrectly and get entered by the crash, but he misses the timing with his footing, which resulted in them hitting their knees on the bike's handlebars, throwing them head first onto one car and flipping shoulder first into the windshield of another, thus breaking the stunt actor's shoulders. He was only off from his planned jump by one millisecond. That's how precise and how down to the wire these stunts come in order for them to be performed properly. The car choreography alone for this Fast Five scene was planned with maneuvers hard enough for a regular car and an experienced driver to pull off, but now additionally adding the four and a half ton vault to it. Well, you can see where that might create problems. Like right here with the reverse 180 move where Brian is behind the vault driving driving in reverse, pushing the vault after escaping the cops on one street with Dom still towing the vault in the front. After turning a quarter and keeping the line, having to now, along the side of the vault, speed past it in reverse, followed by quickly turning the steering wheel to propel the car face forward and shift back into drive and keep pace with Dom once again, isn't just dangerous, it seems and looks on the surface impossible. 
and that's what comes across on screen. In one earlier part of the chase, cop cars are moving in a way that appears that they're coming right at the pair. So they each pull off and drive to the side, allowing the Volt's momentum to fly right past them, smashing into one of the cars like a battering ram. That previous example, that margin of error being small, this is another example of something that could have easily gone wrong if off by just the smallest of variables. But let's look more closely. To create diversions for the cops and to properly look as they, they were swinging the vault into a bunch of parked cars, they didn't just need an actual vault. They needed a specially designed three in particular. Of course, we have the real one shown in almost every scene, but a specially fitted semi-truck would follow Dom and Brian and Kareen into all the cars at the right time. Again, down to the milliseconds for maximum effect on screen, all assisted by, again, the vault. Or take the scenes where the vault is shown going past a bus full of pedestrians, which would be extremely dangerous in real life, obviously. Or another where the vault was wrapped around a cut up and modified truck, a serious control factor comes into play so that no one can actually will be crushed by this thing. There's even a moment when the vault is thrown through a building and has to tumble and crash in and out of that building. Now here, this isn't a vault being controlled by a semi truck, like in the example before. That's done by constructing a real building with people inside and a ram that would push the vault on a track to propel it across the entire inside of the building, while the people inside know their marks so they aren't crushed to death. But again, not everything goes as planned. Another example of this are the oversights that happen all the time on set. You get there and you don't realize that you didn't think of certain things because in rehearsals or in planning, they weren't practical enough for you to notice until it was right in front of you. Like the fact that the stunt driver in that truck we keep talking about was dealing with temperatures around 190 degrees. This is causing the driver to pass out in the car as the heat was unbearable. So the first solution was to fill it with dry ice to cool off the interior, but that brought a new problem. The dry ice sucked up all the oxygen, meaning now the driver wasn't just cold, he couldn't breathe. So on top of all that, they now had to add a special tubing system, leading the fresh air outside into the vault so the driver could breathe while driving. Not the first thing that comes to mind. The big finale of the heist ends with a final face-off on the bridge, where now it's just Dom dragging the safe in an attempt to spin the car around and drive headfirst at his pursuers. This 180 move here was planned to the exact measurements with such a small window that there was literally no room for error at all according to the stunt coordinator, not even a inch. After that, as Dom is taking out the cop cars, one car gets completely cut in half by the tethering cable. That car had a real person in it who had to make sure they ducked at the exact right second or else he would turn out just like the car did. And in the end, when the Volt's momentum rips the charger into the air, they use cranes to pull the car as the driver jumps out with milliseconds to spare. All of this is insane. Thoroughly planned, technical, and practical work for a scene that lasts just shy of only 10 minutes. Imagine the work that goes into the entire movie's runtime. Film stunt coordinators were told this wouldn't be possible to pull off this bank heist scene here, but they did it. This was real with real stakes. If anything went wrong, well, those stakes would come to fruition. Aside from a few injuries and some last minute fixes to unforeseen problems, the crew of Fast Five was able to immerse the audience by not telling you that this can be done, but by showing you it can be done before you even imagine that something like this is or is not possible. So whether you enjoy the Fast franchise or not, you have to respect the hard work that was put into creating the realness you see on screen. The authenticity as much as you can call it that. Obviously, these are still stunts. And while these films may not always be my particular cup of tea, as someone who respects the process of truly making something so powerful that not only do you believe in the once thought unbelievable, but also enough to create true immersion, it's hard not to respect that. And it's also hard not to respect the work put into something like this to push a franchise forward in meaningful ways. This franchise that was once dying is now over a billion dollar franchise, and that might be the most impressive thing of all. I guess the point here is that almost in every movie, reality is only what you make it, right? You, the viewer, if you don't accept the film or show's offer of immersion, if you don't sign that contract metaphorically, if you don't actively engage, it's easy to poke fun at something like Fast and Furious. But if you give in, if you let yourself feel this moment, and the film does its job of not giving you an opportunity to come out of it, well then it's moments like these that become the truly magical experiences that every film buff and film fan convinces you exist. No, you don't need to watch every Academy Award nominee to understand the power of film. Sometimes it isn't the writers, it's these guys, the stunt coordinators, that give you those moments that you will never forget. Well guys, that's it for today's episode of Nerdstalgic. As always, if you enjoyed the video, press the like button down below, and if you haven't yet done so, also hit subscribe. And as always, on your screen right now, two more episodes of Nerdstalgic. Click on either of those to see well, what's up on the channel recently, and hopefully I will see you guys in the next video.